Hello, I'm Professor Mark Considine. I'm the Provost at the University of Melbourne and also a member of the university's political science program. So there are many pleasures for me in a day like this one. The university is delighted to be a partner in this exciting initiative in collaboration with the Susan McKinnon Foundation. The foundation was established in 2015 by Dr. Sophie O oh and Mr. Grant Rule to fulfill their desire to make a positive difference. The foundation believes that leadership is the key to a brighter future for Australia. By fostering better leadership, the foundation aims to create more effective government and obtain the greatest leverage for positive change into our society and economy. The university through the Melbourne School of Government is extremely pleased to have collaborated with Susan McKinnon Foundation to develop the McKinnon Prize. The School of Government addresses challenges facing contemporary government and develops shared interdisciplinary solutions to those challenges. The McKinnon Prize is therefore an independent and non-partisan award for outstanding political leadership in Australia. The prize celebrates political leaders at all levels of government and recognises those who have driven and achieved positive change and those who have also modelled positive behaviour for others. Having such a prize also aims to deepen the national conversation about the role of politicians and our aspirations for political leadership. There's probably no better year than this one for us to pause and reflect on just how important our political leaders are at every level. This national prize also aims to inspire current and future leaders across the country to help shape the future of political leadership in Australia. It hopes to shift the focus from the rather relentless attention to shortcomings and mistakes and move it to an evaluation of strength, good judgment and innovation where those things can be found and valued. Thank you to everyone who put forward a nomination in 2019. There were many outstanding cases for us to consider. And I'd also like to thank my fellow selection panel members for devoting their time and effort. This year, our panel included former Prime Minister Julia Gillard and distinguished leaders from business, government, education, the community sector, and the sporting arenas. Thank you also to the Australian Financial Review for hosting this event. And finally, I'd like to give my warmest congratulations to this year's prize winners. The Right Honourable Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Capp, who's being awarded the McKinnon Prize for Emerging 2019 Political Leader of the Year, and the Honourable Gladys Berejiklian, Premier of New South Wales and recipient of the 2019 McKinnon Prize for Political Leader of the Year. Thank you for joining me to celebrate the achievements of these outstanding leaders. I'd now like to hand us back to our host. Thanks, Mark. 2020 has been one hell of a year. Along with the business community, our governments have been facing the challenge of keeping the economy operating under unprecedented circumstances. Hard decisions have been made, first through the Team Australia approach of National Cabinet. But now we're seeing cracks emerge as states adopt a more parochial approach to their state borders. How politics plays out beyond the current crisis and as borders reopen is yet to be seen. But the hard decisions will continue, as will the intense scrutiny of politicians and their decisions. As Mark said, better political leadership is at the heart of strong governments, creating positive change for the economy and society. In times of crisis, though, leadership qualities really are revealed. Against this backdrop, the Australian Financial Review is pleased to partner with the University of Melbourne's Melbourne School of Government and the Susan McKinnon Foundation to present this special webcast edition of the McKinnon Prize in Political Leadership Oration. Hosting this discussion with Gladys Berejiklian and Sally Cap today, our political editor, Philip Curry, will discuss their leadership in this current crisis, their hopes for the next generation of leaders, and what the hallmarks of good political leadership may look like in the future. Over to you, Phil. Okay, well, thank you, Michael, and welcome subscribers to the uh, inaugural McKinnon Prize in Political Leadership. And uh, due to the extraordinary circumstances in which we find ourselves it's another webinar, but um, that will be more than made up for by the calibre of our two guests, New South Wales, our two guests and recipients, I should say, of the, the reward, New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian and Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne, 
Sally, Kat, thank you very much for making time, both of you. Um, extraordinarily busy times for everybody, but no, no more so than the both of you. Uh, Premier, could I start with you? Um, you have been right at the, at the forefront um, of the COVID crisis. Your state has done a lot of the heavy lifting. You have uh, shown a, a, quite a pronounced leadership role amongst the premiers in the national cabinet, yourself and Daniel Andrews, Andrews from the outset. The, the crisis has thrown up, I think you would agree, challenges you mm. probably never anticipated. We've never seen our leaders face in peacetime in this country. Can I ask you from the outset, do you, do you find it hard to strike a balance or how do you find a balance between what's doing right and, 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 what, and doing what's perhaps popular, especially in this situation where you have to make a lot of decisions on the fly um, and you have no guide, guidelines to go by? Yeah, Phil, I think um, I always say to my colleagues when they used to get upset about something, unless it's life and death, don't get upset about it. But a pandemic is life and death. Um, and it's about livelihoods. And so um, earlier on, I discovered some resilience and courage I didn't think I had in actually not caring what people think about the decisions I make, so long as I make the right call for the community. And also, I rely heavily on good people around me, experts, colleagues, um, people who've done emergency management uh, responses before. So I feel um, surrounding yourself with a good team and not caring what the commentary will say with all due respect. Yeah, fine. Because uh, <laughs> uh, the commentary gets information from various sources, but when you're in the thick of it um, and people are relying on you, and also you have the fear yourself. I mean, early on I was petrified about my parents, petrified about what it meant for my family, and that fear inspires you to do the right thing. And so I think... Um, uh, I, I gave up caring about what people think. And, and to be honest, um, uh, I often found that my leadership in New South Wales was kind of collateral for whatever reason. I was kind of there and doing my thing and, and even today I continue to go a bit unnoticed, but I don't mind that because um, I'm focused on doing what's right. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think that's the way I've tried to lead. But having said that, Phil, I always ask myself, um, what would I have done differently, if anything, if I was facing an election, which is what a few of my colleagues have been facing? And I hope the answer is not too much different. Um, is, but is there anything that comes to mind? Is there, I'm sorry? Is there anything that comes to mind? No, there's no. nothing. I feel that I've made every decision based on what I think is the best outcome for my citizens, for the state. Um, but I've not thought about the consequences of my decisions apart from what I think is in the best interest of my state. Terrific. Well, Miss Cap, to you, um, you're similar to Miss Berejiklian in, in one sense. Both of you were put into a leadership position without an election. You both, um, you stepped into the job under circumstances in 2018, Miss Berejiklian, when Mike Baird retired. 2017. Uh, 2017, sorry, yeah, Sally in 2018. You do have an election coming up in October. You're right in the epicentre of this crisis for Australia at the moment. Is that factoring into your thoughts and decisions as you try to you know, play your role in helping your city? Phil, uh, I did come in on an election actually as a by-election uh, and hadn't experienced anything like that before. And yes, we have another election next month, which does bring different dimensions uh, to, I think different dimensions really to the noise, but not to what we're doing day to day. It's absolutely critical uh, here in Melbourne that we spend every moment making sure uh, that we are thinking about planning and delivering as many good outcomes for uh, Melburnians who are going through one of the most extreme situations any of us have ever experienced. And we know that the health response is the priority, uh, but we do have to balance that, as Gladys was saying, with livelihoods. And being in local government, uh, really it's the strong voice of our local business owners, their teams and people that have been impacted, uh, particularly by economic health hardship uh, that are the loudest and uh, the people we're talking to daily. So it's a matter of channeling uh, all of that, not just the feedback, but the passion and the energy and the emotion and making sure I'm representing that well in terms of what we can do as a capital city council, but also being that uh, chief champion into other levels of government that have more resources uh, than we do, but nonetheless are as focused 
uh, on the City of Melbourne, its scale and the influence it has on state and national economies. Well, but before this, uh, uh, Melbourne was, I think, was it the most livable city or one of the most livable cities in the world. How do you think it's going to look in a year's time? And what do you think you can do about that in your capacity as mayor, should you, you know, remain in the position beyond October? What can you bring to bear from the, from the perspective of a local government rather than a state or federal government? Mm. Well, look, the pandemic has changed the world. Uh, and uh, I know people talk about the new normal. We say the new extraordinary. We want to come back better. Uh, and I know that everyone's using this time of disconnect to try and really progress so many uh, ambitions and, and issues that we, we faced before. We know that Melbourne will be different, uh, but it doesn't have to be so different. We've got uh, fantastic foundations that our economy and community have been built upon, certainly over the last few decades. In fact, in the early 90s, when Melbourne was really suffering from a, a financial recession and we were described as a moribund city in a rust bucket state, we have, like a phoenix, re-emerged, as you said, as one of the most livable cities in the world. And and those foundations uh, are still here. So for us, it's really a matter of making sure that we can help as many businesses, organisations and residents survive during this time of extended lockdown and a huge amount of preparation going into the reactivation of our city when it's safe to do so. I know from speaking to mayors around the world that the pace and the strength of that reactivation really sets that positive momentum for how quickly we can recover. We still want to be and will be the major events capital. We want to be still the, uh, a capital city of music of literature, uh, of uh, a place where people come together. We're renowned uh, with great Melburnians. They're terrific participants uh, for people coming together. But of course, from an economic perspective, two major banks still here, the heart of the industry super, and of course, a knowledge city with uh, all nine universities having a very strong footprint in our city economy. It's those foundations that we'll need to grow and take forward as we uh, rebuild the city of Melbourne. Terrific. Um, well, Premier, um, just on leadership, you've, um, you've had a few challenges in, 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 in your short years at the helm and we saw last week right in the midst of this crisis when you're holding your state together um th th there's a bit of internal ructions with the nationals um and you you stared that down how what on, on leadership not just in relation to that event but more generally how do you hold a team together when it fractures and how how much more difficult is that when you're occupied 24 7 you know, with such issues as, as, as the virus and trying to control yeah. I think it's fair to say that when you're dealing with um, a crisis, as we are in New South Wales and across the nation, your tolerance levels aren't what they normally are. I'm normally a very tolerant person. I tend to bring people together. I tend to work on a consensus basis. Everybody has a different leadership style. But, um, but during a pandemic, my tolerance levels are far reduced. And um, I have, you know, premiers have lots of power as do prime ministers and you exercise them when you need to and um, that's what I did. Well, just, just get on with it, basically. That's it. <laughs> no, time to, no time to mess around. Um, staying, staying with you, Premier, well, in your role, I mean, I, I mean at the beginning of the crisis um, when no one was quite sure who was in charge of what and... And there were various there were differences of opinion between yourselves and, and the prime minister on what should be shut down and what should be kept open and so forth. Uh, that seemed to settle fairly quickly. Um, yeah. When we've seen differences of opinion reemerge as you know, yeah become more volatile. Do you, overall, the national cabinet it's been for, for the better or for the worse. Um, Definitely for the better. I haven't agreed with everything that we've done and the way we've done it, but certainly um, I felt that I that we were vindicated in kind of shutting down when we did early on because it gave us time to build up capacity in our health system, put our systems together. And remember, New South Wales had just come through, well, we were still dealing with the aftermath of the horrific bushfires. Mm. But what really stuck in my mind from that experience was the only way we got through that was the whole of government interagency response. So um, back in January, February, I actually put police in charge of our pandemic response, not health. And... Um, 
and utilise that whole of government approach to allow health to focus on what they need to focus on. And so I think that ex you know, going from that experience to this one gave me that level of, um, I guess, assurance that you had to lead in a particular way and construct your governance in a particular way. And I do feel that that lockdown in March was absolutely necessary to give us the time to make everything COVID safe. I mean, imagine we have 2,200 schools across the state. Mm. Each of them now has two cleaning contracts on top of what they had, right? Um, every business now has a COVID safe plan. So it gave us time. And our, and our health system, we've pretty much quadrupled our capacity for ventilators and intensive care beds. And that wouldn't have been made possible if we didn't have that time to control the virus to um, inform the public of what we could expect moving forward and then set ourselves up to be COVID safe and touch wood, now we're in a position where we are controlling the virus and have our economy open. In fact, yesterday I was absolutely pleasantly surprised to get 50,000 jobs back in the last month. Uh, so we're 70% back the jobs we'd lost and obviously before JobKeeper runs out in March, we want to get back to full capacity and that's our aim. Um, and, uh, and so therefore I think it was okay. Sometimes leadership is about doing your own thing, um, but also respecting the others. But now I feel um, in terms of borders and quarantine, the PM's definitely on, uh, you know, doing the right thing by all of us. And I think we should support him in his efforts to open up the nation because um, because otherwise the, the, the jobs and the economic growth that we need just won't happen. How, how is your relationship with Dan Andrews through all this? Oh, really, really good. We get on very well. We have different views of things, of how things should happen. I'm much more robust in, I think, opening up the economy mm. and making sure we're going, full, you know, at, at full pace. Um, and that's just a philosophical difference. Uh, having said that, he had different challenges I did. But um, I would argue, you know, putting police in charge of a lot of the compliance and logistics really supported the New South Wales efforts and then health was able to focus on what they did. And, again, I think that learning came from the bushfires right. and um, has stood us in good stead. Uh, so initially, Dan and I were very much on the same page, two most popular states, uh, worried about the case numbers, having to shut down, which we both did. But then I think since that time, we've had a different approach. Mm. Um, but that's also been, been because of the circumstance. But we still get on really well. We're in constant communication. And um, I think the important thing in leadership is respect. You can have different views on how to do things. But I think we also have commonality in that we are the two most popular states. And um, what I stress about is really what's happening consumption and GST moving forward. New South Wales and Victoria subsidise the whole nation. With, with Victoria out of action, it puts enormous pressure on New South Wales, which is why I'm trying to convince my other state colleagues to say, hang on, it might be nice being able to tell your community you've got zero or one case, yes. but um, what are you going to tell them when they don't have a job or when they don't, um, you know, when they can't send their kids to the school they want or whatever else down the track? So um, our GSP, as you know, relies on other states consuming from us and similarly consumption relies on us being able to deal with the other states. Do you think the balance, we've had the balance right from the outset uh, with, with the health and the economic? Uh, no. 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 Because I think some states have hidden behind border closures mm -hmm. so and that's restricted economic growth and development. Um, whereas I've said, have faith in your health system. If you have faith in your health system, you'll put down your border. I mean, we had one community case overnight in New South Wales. Why would any state close their borders to us? I just don't get it. I honestly don't get it. You said, yeah. you said earlier that you, know, you don't have the political pressures of some of, some of your counterparts because you don't have an election. Do you believe some of it is political? Well, um, although I think... Look, it could, well, I, yeah, uh, short answer is yes, but I think that's been stated already. But again, I can't, I can't take the high moral ground because I don't know how I'd act under those circumstances. Um, but having said that, uh, I'm always one that would um, make decisions based on science and data um, and evidence, and I would hope they would do the same. Sally, um, on, on the National Cabinet, that's replaced COAG, which was around for a long time. Uh, as you know, the, the body that t tied all the tiers of government together, there's no real role for local government on, on the COAG. Do, do you feel a bit shut out? Would you like, especially if this rapid decision-making process that is going on now with the nation, do you think, would you like to see a vehicle to give local government a bit of a voice in one of those forums? Well, I, I believe that the uh, National Association of Local Governments does sit in on COAG, but, but really it, it, it is frustrating sometimes uh, 
not to be in those discussions. That's why we've reinvigorated the Council of Capital City Lord Mayors and we're using that as a platform to do more uh, lobbying and advocacy into federal government in particular. But here in our state, uh, you know, I have a very close relationship with the state government and that's important because uh, the city of Melbourne economy, which had just clicked over $104 billion pre-COVID, represents about a quarter of the state's gross state product and as a result of the pandemic, our losses here in the city of Melbourne, our forecast losses at 110 billion over the next five years, represent more than half of the state's losses. So uh, our uh, ability and uh, need to work together has certainly been heightened uh, during this crisis. And uh, I've really welcomed uh, the accessibility and the way uh, that look, often they're fierce conversations, uh, but nonetheless, it is about that relationship building so that you can be strident uh, in representing the voice of our constituents here in the city of Melbourne, but leave plenty of room for ongoing conversations and negotiation. And that's the sort of relationship we've been able to set up with the state government. And do you have a working relationship with the Premier yourself? Absolutely, yes. We are uh, in contact regularly. We meet weekly. Uh, more recently, we've been able to agree, for example, to uh, the joint uh, Melbourne City Recovery Fund, $100 million, to uh, really invest in the reactivation and kickstarting of our economy. Uh, and those sorts of things only come about by staying focused on the outcome, uh, on making sure that we... Um, you know, we, we stay absolutely um, focused on what is necessary to deliver and make a difference to small business owners and residents in the city of Melbourne. And by doing that, staying focused on the issue was what I was trying to say. Uh, we've been able to find some really good ways forward, even though in many cases uh, I am championing views that are quite different to the Premier's from time to time. Sure. One, one, one observation I want to get from both of you, and probably starting with you, Premier, you've been in politics a fair while now, about 17 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, um, before we get the Federation, the, the, this, we're now seeing the Federation probably operate like it's never operated before. The states, I, I, I can't remember them being so powerful or, or wielding such power in, in a couple of decades I've been covering politics. What, what, in your view, are the positives that have come out of this for the Federation and where have you seen the negatives or the, or the flaws? And, I, yeah. and, where, and, where, and how would you like to see those fixed? Yeah, well, I think the positives are a recognition, which I've always tried to argue. Firstly, we need less red tape when we're dealing with each other and when the states are dealing with the Commonwealth, hmm. and that's an ongoing work in progress. Secondly, an acknowledgement that when the Federation formed, the states were very much the same size, economically, socially, all that stuff. Uh, that is a very different situation now. You've got a state the size of New South Wales and a jurisdiction the size of the ACT, essentially having an equal seat at the table, and you can't go by the law of averages on every decision you take. So I think the positive has been an acknowledgement that the larger states and the smaller states have very fundamental and different approaches to the Federation, and we have to accept that. That is not something to be criticised, it's something to be welcomed. That's what makes our nation diverse and great and all those things. Um, I think a negative downside is that state, you know, all premiers, of course, believe in state, states' rights, but we can't uh, separate that too much from the fact that we're Australian. We're part of a nation. And I think some states have overstepped the mark in terms of acknowledging that. Perhaps it's because I'm from New South Wales and we think a bit more differently and perhaps more globally because we're larger. But I think an upside is an acknowledgement that every state has its um, unique set of circumstances and conditions, uh, uh, but that the similarities we have are a good good uh, platform from which to operate. Um, but a downside, I think, from the last few months has been states overstepping their mark and, and, and not thinking themselves as part of a nation. You can't take the GST revenue on the one hand and all the tax benefits on the one hand and say, I'll take that, but I won't give you anything back. I mean, that to me is, is not a logical way to move forward. And on that, say with the relations with the federal government, we've seen examples, as you, you would well know, the, the Ruby Princess, for example, where we had a couple of state agencies and a federal agency all sort of standing around and wondering whose job it was to do what. We've seen it with aged care to an extent in Melbourne. Um, not quite blame shifting, but just split responsibilities. And when it 
comes to the crunch, no one seems to actually <laughs> have, have a lead role or be in charge. Is, is that an observation you would share? Are there other areas you've noticed that, you know, in, in this crisis? And would you like to... Yeah, do you think I, it's, I, like, yeah, I think... It's, big things? Yeah, I think in the pandemic, um, each level of government had to assume responsibility in areas they'd never had experience in. Um, if you told me a year ago I'd have to worry about quarantining hmm. and uh, various other things, I would have balked and said, no, I won't. Um, so mistakes were made. But I also feel that hopefully this will support the reform process moving forward because accountability is very black and white, not grey, but in a lot of federal-state relations, there's a lot of grey. So I'm someone who likes to know what I'm responsible for. I'll manage it well. But the grey is what is challenging. And so I think um, I would like to see that come a bit. I'm sorry? We've discovered a lot of grey, haven't we? Exactly. But I would um, but I would much prefer moving forward that we have a really good um, conversation about how we can make roles and responsibilities and accountabilities much more black and white as opposed to grey. Um, and there are a number of areas in which we can do that. But I also think in a pandemic, it's all hands on deck, literally. Uh, every every state and, and, and the national government uh, do what we can to get through the, the crisis together. And in the main, I think it's it's managed. But in areas where we have joint responsibility, it's been difficult. Um, but I think we're getting through those issues. And again, as the eternal optimist, I hope it would lead to um, permanent reform because in New South Wales, we've actually changed many of our systems and introduced reform which we were able to accelerate during COVID, which will keep post-COVID. And I think reform of the Federation is one of those things as well, which we should start and definitely maintain moving forward. I'd also like to see much more bilateral relationships between the Commonwealth and the states. I don't want to wait for every single state to sign up to something if I believe it's in my citizens' best interest to have an arrangement with the federal government. But I also don't want to see 43 different national partnership arrangements. So I think consolidation of those agreements, more bilateral relationships, rather than going on the law of averages are some of the reforms we can take moving forward. But also thinking about aged care and early childhood and and areas where we should have either state or federal responsibility, not both. And even in the health system, we don't have GPs or Medicare, but we control the hospital systems and, and manage other bits of it. So I think more black and white going forward is good for our nation and good for the Federation. And that's what I would like to keep pushing. I said never waste a crisis. I mean, there's been a lot of attempts. For reform, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I mean, do you think we might just... Once a vaccine comes along or we get used to this virus, we may just go back to that complacency about federation, would you? Well, I won't. I don't think we will. No. There's too much at stake and too much opportunity. And I think if, if Australia plays its cards right, we can actually show global leadership in being a safe place to invest, to work, to live. Our management of the pandemic will actually increase investment opportunities and also allow us to consider more carefully supply chains in an advanced manufacturing uh, digital age. I mean, you know, we were locked out of manufacturing for decades because of wages, but the digital age relies on high, high skills and different forms of investment and venture capital. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to actually look at those supply chains, look at how we can be a regional leader in many ways. And uh, that can only happen if, if we work together and support the, the nation in terms of those objectives. Terrific. Well, well, we've had a lot of, we had some some of the subscribers to this forum have sent in a lot of questions and there's a very common theme amongst them. Um, one of them is the state of politics you know, and there seems to be a view out there that it's just deteriorated. I'm, I'm not sure if I share that view, but maybe just been a bit close to it for a long time, but that what matters is what's external. Um, Ms. Berejiklian, you've been in politics a long time. Ms. Cap, you've only been in it a short time um, and... You know, in this era of social media, which adds so many more layers of you know, difficulty, I think, to anyone in the political establishment and abuse. Can I ask you why you got into it? Um, do you want to make it a long career? Do you have aspirations beyond local local government? Um, and what's your advice? I get, uh, one of the many questions to, uh, to, to, to women wanting to enter politics, mm. especially with the sort of the viciousness that, that's more aimed at women than men on social media. Do you want to, it's a bit of a muddle, but could you address all that? You know, what made you do it? 
Well, uh, I certainly uh, didn't have it on a grand plan, Phil, I can say that. But uh, what did happen is I became very uh, full of uh, particular passion uh, for Melbourne and concern uh, about uh, the situation that Melbourne found itself in. And, and in those circumstances, uh, you know, there comes that point where you think, well, I'm going to actually step up and try and make a difference to this situation or I'm going to walk away. As some that absolutely uh, loves Melbourne, a proud Melbourne, and I had that uh, sense of really stepping forward and doing something uh, to make a difference, and that's what I did. In many ways, I look back over my career, which is mostly private sector, and I'm really a millennial before my time. I have zigzagged my way across sectors uh, and industry, and I, I've absolutely loved it. And uh, some people would look at my resume and say, it, it's definitely not the classic uh, pathway into to politics. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the diversity of that background and I think a, a really solid standing in business and how to make things happen and an extensive network as well has stood me in good stead in the two and a bit years that I've been, I call myself a small P politician in local uh, government. And I absolutely love it. That sense of public service, uh, the sense of satisfaction that comes uh, from delivering outcomes for the community uh, and uh, knowing that what you're doing can actually make a difference. I think local government, given the connection uh, to our constituents, uh, is deeply satisfying in that way. And I would encourage anybody uh, who feels strongly uh, about making a contribution to put their hand up. I've never been more confronted, uh, um, nervous, uh, feeling completely outside my comfort zone as I, I have during the last uh, two and a half years in different circumstances, including through the election to become Lord Mayor. I, I experienced many... Go on. Sorry, could you give an example of... Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I've realised really early in the election process last time that uh, people make very quick judgments and, and uh, assumptions about uh, our politicians and people that put their hand up for these roles. And I really encourage everybody to be more curious and ask more questions and find out more detail because in the first forum I went to with the community, a lovely gentleman stood up right at the start and I'd come from uh, running the property council here in Victoria and he stood up and said, Sally, there is nothing you can say tonight that will convince us that you, you're not here for any other reason than to represent greedy developers mm -hmm. and there is no way we will vote for you. And uh, I really took the opportunity to say these are serious jobs and, uh, and they deserve candidates that have uh, good uh, skills, experiences and appropriate CVs to be able to take on these roles. And, and I encouraged him to actually think about the sort of skills and experiences in the person he wanted uh, representing him as Lord Mayor. Uh, but it really taught me the aggression was actually palpable uh, towards me and the negativity, and I had to, to fight my way through many of those situations. The great news, Phil, is that after the election, when I went back to that community forum, that gentleman, Peter, stood up and said, Sally, you actually pro prompted and provoked us into thinking about the questions you asked, and we ended up voting for you. That's a terrific example. What are you, Premier? You've been in the game nearly two decades. How have you seen it change? Is, and it has been, do you think it's changed? Or, and, is, and if so, has it been for better or worse in terms of being able to do your job um, and, and deal with the various pressures? Yeah, I think um, social media has changed things very much uh, because everybody feels they're empowered to have a voice and sometimes the loudest voices don't represent the majority of the community. So that, that is an issue. Uh, it's certainly made the job more challenging. But I, have, I think we have to expect and accept that um, uh, people elected to office uh, are prone to make mistakes, just as people who aren't elected to office are. We're far from perfect. Um, and this old notion that somehow someone elected to office has to have this perfect situation and perfect set of circumstances be right all the time is just a fallacy. So I think the, I think it would help the process if we just expected or accepted that people are in it to try and the vast majority of people that I know on any side of politics are in it to make a difference. They're in it for the right reasons. Um, they try their hardest. We don't always succeed. 
Um, but you know, you, you do. I've I've had years to build up resilience, but I feel that if someone just came in after a couple of years and did my job, it would be very difficult. But I've had that years of resilience, and um, and I, I think it's getting more difficult. And I don't want to say that because I want to encourage people to to consider what I regard as a very noble profession, uh, a profession which is worthy of respect, uh, given given um, the responsibility it bears. But I think there's also part of the Australian culture is that heavy, that kind of level of cynicism towards authority, which um, is pretty much unique to Australia, really, compared to other places. And that's part and parcel of the deal. But I think, in my experience, most people have the right motivation and are trying their best, far from perfect. Um, and I think we have to accept that and accept that our democracy isn't without fault but it's a pretty robust system and has served our states and nations well compared to other parts of the world. And, and um, I don't think it's going to get any easier, to be honest, the 24-hour news cycle. But even for the media, as you know, Phil, consolidation of the press is also having an impact on how politics is reported and, and, and how it, you know, and, and unfortunately I'm someone who likes to get into the nuts and bolts and detail of an issue, which you can't. You can't get that across. If you can't get it across in a 10-second grab, it's really difficult to explain that, which is why I think one of the advantages during the crisis has been people have tuned in more for a longer period of time when leaders are communicating. So I would never have thought that any of my press conferences would be worthy of um, real-time real -time communication to citizens, sure. but that has helped give people context and build confidence and trust. And, um, uh, and I hope it lasts not, I'm yeah. saying generally, I'm talking generic terms, I hope it lasts a little bit of time post-COVID as well yeah. uh, because we have been in this together and everyone's trying their best. Do You, you, said, you said at the beginning you, you, you do what you think is right, not what the commentary and others said. Do you, do you read it? Do you follow social media or do you just block it out? No, I don't follow social media. I don't have time. Hmm. Um, I don't. I just don't follow social media at all. You read the papers much. Do, huh? huh? Do you read the papers much? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I do, I do, I do read. I read every word. I well, not every word, but I, I do read print. But interestingly, Phil, you, you'll like this. Mm. I used to just read the papers that were dedicated to New South Wales, but I think this crisis has really brought national interest uh, to, to what people read and consume. I doubt people in Western Australia would have cared what I was doing a couple of months ago, but I'm actually getting a lot of correspondence from people all across Australia, and I'm sure my counterparts in other states are as well. Mm -hmm. So I think this really has shed a light on, on leadership beyond your state uh, and beyond what you normally look at. And I think that's a positive because the more national and global perspective we have, I think better off we'll be as citizens. That's terrific. Well, well, we'll wrap up in a second. I'll just ask you one question to both of you before we conclude. And this, again, comes from a subscriber. I've used the word learning. I won't use that. I'll use lesson. But it says, <laughs> what, what has the, been the biggest lesson uh, that both of you have learned from this crisis? I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Cap. Wow, so many lessons, and uh, I think Gladys has touched on some fantastic points uh, already. Uh, the biggest lesson really has been, I think, staying focused on what you believe is uh, the right thing to be doing and on delivering outcomes. There's been a lot of pressure, even on a Lord Mayor, uh, in terms of point scoring. It hasn't been a time for point scoring. It's been a time for focusing on delivering outcomes. There's also been a lot of pressure to be the loudest voice uh, or and really it's the time to to work the hardest uh, to get uh, and to deliver those those outcomes so it's easy at a time in a crisis to be distracted by uh, a lot of that feedback and a lot of the uh, louder debate that goes on but for me the learning has been to stay focused on essential services understand exactly what people are expecting and need from us and then stay very focused on delivering it and in doing that, it's been good for me because I have been able to have those discussions with state politicians and federal politicians and just remain focused on those outcomes rather than get embroiled in a lot of the noise and debate that's been happening around me. Terrific. Um, firstly, um, lead with courage. It's okay to change course. It's okay to stuff up so long as you learn from it and move forward and uh, be as adaptable and flexible as possible. Don't 
be so rigid that you can't change course or need to change things given the evolving situation. And so that's probably my biggest group of learnings. Lessons. Do you feel... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't... Do, do you feel more more confident, both of you, as, as a consequence of, you know, basically some of the cut-through decisions you just had to make and get on with things? Has it given you both of you a confidence? De I definitely feel more confident because... Um, Early on, early on, it was extremely difficult during the lockdown, not knowing which way to go. But now I feel extremely confident that we have a strategy in place and, and how to manage the future is um, less, far less daunting. In fact, I'm feeling quite optimistic about the opportunities that this has brought us. Um, in New South Wales, you know, we're now using e-health, e-planning, uh, digital platforms like we never have. Uh, productivity is increasing even though people are working flexibly. So I think, um, as you said, never waste a crisis in terms of reform and we're trying to certainly see the green shoots during what's been a very difficult time. Okay, well, terrific. Well, look, thank you both very much. I found that quite fascinating, that conversation, and I would like to thank both the Mayor and the Premier for your, for your candour. I thought some of the Premier's comments especially were, were most revealing as to, as to what's been going on uh, behind the scenes as our leaders at state and federal level have had to grapple with this thing with no set of instructions uh, to guide them, no precedent to guide them. Uh, we've conducted this forum, I think, amidst the first tinge of optimism we've had as a country for, for several weeks, if not months. Uh, we're now, for the first time, everything is moving again in the right direction in terms of opening up our borders and our economy, as Victoria it looks like it's getting this thing under control. So uh, congratulations to all of you and the roles you're playing as a nation. We're grateful for all our political leaders, although it doesn't often come across <laughs> like that all the time. And Miss Cap, um, to you, you've got an election next month. We wish you all the best for that and every continued success uh, should should you be triumphant and to you, Miss Berridge and thank you for everything you're doing. So again, for your time, we appreciate it. Um, it's an extraordinary time and to all you out there who have subscribed to this, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to A, subscribe and B, and, and B to watch and I hope uh, we've managed to answer some, if not most of your, your inquiries and your curiosities. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.